Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar hosted by Cypher. We're looking at HR software, especially for the education sector. It's great to have you with us today. Um, I'm Catherine, I'm Head of Content here at Cypher. I'm joined by Phil King, Commercial Director, and Courtney Erst, Head of Implementation Services. Hi Phil and Courtney, how are you today? Morning Catherine, all good, how are you? Good, thank you. Hi Courtney. Well, thanks, well thanks. I'm good, thanks for being here. Um, just to give you a quick overview of our agenda before we get stuck in, we're going to tell you a little bit about Cypher as a company and the services we provide before looking at the strategic and operational challenges faced by HR in the UK education sector. We'll look at the role of technology and working with the specialist HR solutions provider, and the implementation journey and the user journey through um, using HR software, the business case and expected benefits of um, using specialist HR software, and we'll also be able to act tackle your questions in a Q&A at the end of the session. So if you want to send us any questions, use the control panel that's on your screen throughout the broadcast. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be emailed to you later today. That means you can revisit any of the slides if you want or share that information with a colleague who maybe wasn't able to join us today. So bear with me a second while I change over presenter, I'm gonna hand control over to Phil and hopefully you'll see his slides in a moment. Perfect, thanks Phil. Can you can you see that, Catherine? Yep. Yes, brilliant. And can you see these boxes on the right hand side or do I need to remove those? No, that's all good. We've got a nice clear view of the slide. Nice clear view. Right. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you for your time today. It's really appreciated. Um, as, as Catherine said, really we're going to be spending about sort of 40, 45 minutes talking about tech in the education space. Um, and yes, that's going to be a little bit focused around Cypher and us as an organization and the solutions and services that we can provide to support organizations across what is a very diverse base. Um, but it's also very much around general tech. Um, it's about the challenges, it's about the opportunities, uh, and it's about the, the considerations that you should be thinking about um, in respect of current solutions and services you may be utilizing, um, but also in respect of any selection process you may be choosing to go through. Um, to start off with just a, a tiny little piece around Cypher, if you, if you don't know us, um, we're a long-standing and leading provider, specialist provider of people management solutions. Um, everything from initial talent attraction and hire through onboarding and engaging new hires into your organizations, everything that you'd expect around a sort of robust central operational HR package, payroll, um, learning management, and learning content deployment. Um, we've got approximately 650 customers across the UK, but most importantly in respect of today, we've got significant representation within the UK education sector. And, th and that goes across the whole piece from early years through schools, um, both uh, academy trusts, local authority maintained, um, and independent school sectors, but also through to FE and HE institutions. Okay. After today, if you want to find out any more about any of our product solutions or services, please visit our website or email us at info at cipher.com. Okay, just to, to give you a little bit of a feel about our representation in the space, as I've mentioned, um, significant representation in that space across those various demographics. I think one of the things to, to point out here is we're already starting to look at the levels of diversity and complexity across organizations. Um, from large corporate early year settings organizations who might be employing thousands of staff across multiple sites across the UK and even potentially internationally through single settings FE colleges, um, multi-academy trust that may be two, three, ten school settings, etc. Um, and again, we've got significant experience of working across those diverse demographics and have done for the last 15 to 20 years. Okay. So as Catherine mentioned, what we really want to focus on today is looking at some of the strategic and operational challenges that face HR teams in the education sector. And I think that the first thing really to mention is about the size and scale of the sector itself. Um, we've got a couple of statistics on here. Um, and again, depending on, on where you're working, whether you're in early years, whether you're in primary, secondary education, FE or HE, um, you'll have an awareness and an understanding of that size and scale. Um, as you can see, there are over 32,000 schools, colleges and universities across the UK, over one and a half million people working in the education sector. And as you can see, we've just sort of highlighted some of those key demographics within the space. Now, I think 
what that means in relation to when you start thinking about tech is that whilst there are going to be some, some similarities uh, and some shared challenges and opportunities across those various demographics, um, you're also going to have significant levels of diversity as well. So whilst there might be a general requirement that may be common around things like safeguarding uh, and checks and critical compliance criteria that you need to comply with, you're also going to have situations where you may be very, very different, both in terms of the contractual complexity of your employee's makeup, um, but also in terms of numbers of settings, size and scale of your HR, payroll, finance teams, etc. So again, significant scale, some common challenges and opportunities across the space, but we also come across and find significant diversity, both, both across those demographics, but also with within individual institutions as, as well because as you'd expect you're all going to have your own different cultures your own identity your own brand as well okay when we start thinking about sector specific challenges you can see that we've highlighted a, a number of components on here and some of these things we're going to be looking at some examples of how tech can support in a moment um, and we'll talk about that verbalize some of that but we're also going to show you some quick examples as well, some quick videos um, of how you can be looking to allow tech and allow solutions and services to, to really support the way you deliver your operational services uh, to, to your organization. Now, we've got some in the middle there in the, in the, the smaller boxes, but the, the thing I wanna focus on top is the, is the big ticket item as it were. And again, I'm sure you're all extremely familiar with this. And this is really, almost universally shared across all demographics within the education space currently in the UK. It is really very much around the attraction, the development and the retention of staff. Um, very timely, uh, I actually heard on the radio this morning, um, Education Select Committee meeting today um, to discuss amongst other things, employee recruitment and retention, which is a significant challenge. Um, a survey in 2021, um, highlighted that at that point in time, 24% of teachers were leaving the profession within three years. Now that was two years ago. Uh, it may well be the case anecdotally that that situation has got even worse. So in terms of the challenge of not only attracting the right staff in the first place, the challenge of retaining those staff is significant within the UK and, and not just within teaching positions. Um, early years, similarly significant challenges. Um, recent surveys uh, carried out by the Early Education and Child Care Coalition, and this was again very recently in the news, I think only a week or two ago. Again, a survey showing that more than half of all the workers surveyed were considering or planning on leaving the sector in the next 12 months, which is huge. Um, and that is at the same time that the survey also advised that there's an additional 180,000 extra children expected to enter early year settings by 2025. So there is a significant challenge, and there's a number of reasons for that challenge, all of which I'm sure you're, you're very aware. Again, it can depend across the different demographics, but whether it's around pay, benefit, and reward, whether it's around workload, uh, and the challenges that the specific positions bring, whether it's around funding, um, those challenges all mean that you're all in a little bit of a bun fight to, to get the best talent and to retain that talent. So again, we're going to be focusing today on some of the aspects of how tech can help. It can't do everything. Um, it isn't a magic bullet, and I think it would be disingenuous of us as a technology pr provider to, to pretend, uh, pretend that that would be the case. But there are ways in which you can deploy technology to, to support and assist the way that you do try and attract, develop, and retain your staff. Now, within, within the sort of more granular in the weeds of the situation as well, there's a range of sector specific challenges within the education space, ranging from contractual complexity and remuneration structures. So again, the granular detail around things such as term time only, uh, multi-post holders, um, the different types of pay structures that you may have in place from grades, bands, spines, ad hoc. Um, it could be spot salary based. And you're gonna have a range of staff that may be directly related to teaching or childcare and direct interaction with students. Um, as opposed to those staff that may be on the support side of things as well. Everything around safeguarding and checks. How are you ensuring that you're meeting your requirements from a compliance perspective? Uh, are you ensuring that you're carrying out those various safeguarding and checks to ensure that 
staff are checked appropriately, that's managed effectively, and that you can evidence that. Everything around payroll and pensions, I think we're all aware of, uh, again, the impact of things such as multi-post on things like TPS, LGPS, and those pension schemes. And again, coming back to an earlier point, we can't do everything. Uh, as a provider ourselves, we have frankly been burnt in the past in respect of the levels of complexity that exist within the sector. Um, so I think what you find in the market is about a situation where you will have technology that will assist, will support, and can give you significant sort of value add over your competition in the market, whilst appreciating that due to the level of complexity, there may always be a requirement or for a period of time of still some manual interaction, manual intervention with systems and technology as well to support some of those levels of complexity. And again, as part of any selection process, it's about ensuring you get that clarity from the providers that you're considering. There's different business models. Um, we've already mentioned whether you are a large corporate group providing substantial numbers of early, uh, early years childcare settings through to a single setting FE or HE institutions. And you're all going to be subject to a range of statutory returns, whether it's things like single central registers, workforce census returns, FE data co uh, collection or school census returns. We're fully aware of the extra demands that fall on you in terms of providing statutory returns to um, inspectorates um, and government bodies, whether that's around teaching time, teaching staff or support staff. OK, and it's again how you can use technology to support you in that area. And lastly, before we move on, it's about thinking about other IT systems that you have within your infrastructure and ensuring that those systems can interact with the other systems that you may be bringing into place. So if you're looking at bringing a new HR platform, a new recruitment platform, a new payroll system, how is that going to interact with your finance package? How is that going to interact with your school management system so that you have that single point of data entry, so you have data integrity and data accuracy also? And again, we're gonna to touch on these points in more detail in a moment. At the bottom, slightly contentious, I've also got perception of HR. I think in terms of sector specific challenges, education is one of those areas that over many years has seen quite a lot of change. Um, I've been involved in the people management solution space for 25 years, and certainly over the last 10 years, we've seen a significant change in the perception of HR in the education space. And I think that's been primarily around the changes that have occurred from uh, schools moving away in lots of instances from local authority maintained control, where HR and payroll and financial services may have been delivered by the local authority, through to increased professionalization of HR within the independent school sector, where traditionally it was seen as more of a reactive administrative function. So I think that whilst there's been that shift in perception, there's also huge demands on HR payroll finance teams, recruitment and talent management teams to be able to fill that gap to ensure that you are attracting, developing and retaining the best talent. So what is the, the role of technology in, in educational institutions? I think it, it starts to fall into a number of areas. So what you're starting to think about there is a, a range of pillars. It is about thinking about attraction and engagement. How can, you, how can you find the best staff in that competitive environment? How can you compete against that school, that nursery setting down the road to make sure that you get that talent and that you retain them? So again, it's thinking about how tech can support your brand and identity. How can you communicate better at that recruitment stage? And how can you familiarize new hires as they come into your organization? I think one of the key things is that um, I think something like 60% of staff turnover happens in that first six months of employment. So thinking about that great onboarding experience when you bring people into the organization, especially if you've spent a significant amount of time and money in terms of your recruitment and attraction piece, how do you then ensure that you bring them in in the most engaging way? How do you make sure that they come in and they feel comfortable, they feel familiar, you reduce that anxiety? And then how do you continue to develop and retain them? And that's not just around the talent management piece, that is absolutely critical. And, and again, going back to the comment I made earlier around the, the recent survey from Early Education and Child Care Coalition, I think there was very much a focus around internal promotion and review and assessment and succession planning and career development being again a key part of improving that recruitment and retention challenge 
is about ensuring that people coming into the organization recognize that there's a long-term future there's a long-term opportunity as well there's always going to be churn it's, it's a natural part of of any organization in any sector and and as part of the education space as well but it's about ensuring that as far as possible you mitigate against that so the way that you manage your talent is important but well-being also plays a big part in this um, and well-being is not just around pay and reward it's also about how you treat your staff how you communicate um, the learning content that you deploy to them um, how does that support them around neurodiversity around menopause around mental health so again thinking about how you're engaging with your staff to make sure that they stay with you it's not always just about the pay and reward piece okay and then having said that slightly contradicting myself obviously that element around reward and how technology can support how you are tracking recognition and reward and then getting a bit into the weeds of, of the granular detail of operationally how you may operate so that contractual complexity do you have technology or can you get technology that supports complexities around multiple post management? Can you get tools that support the working patterns that you may need to operate across diverse groups? That can be multi-entity and reflect the fact that you might have a number of settings within a group environment, or you may have a primary and a secondary. You might have 10 schools within a multi-academy trust. You might be an independent school with a prep school and a senior school and boarding. How does a, a piece of technology, how does an HR system support that? And I've already mentioned some of those complexities around pay, pay, reward, payroll, pensions, not all of which can be solved by technology and certainly not easily solved by technology. Um, but again, how can we support as far as possible in that space? And then starting to think about that sort of compliance side of things as well as we've mentioned. And compliance is a huge part of any human capital management, any people management HR system that you may be considering, and similarly around recruitment, learning and development, there are significant demands on the sector in respect of compliance, whether it's around safeguarding, whether it's around data protection, um, whether it's around your statutory returns, that ultimately suck up a huge amount of administrative resource and a huge amount of process time. So again, how can technology support in that space? Okay, and again at the bottom you can see there that we've also highlighted around those sort of key areas of data management, process streamlining and administrative reduction. When you start thinking about cost and time savings, there's a huge amount around direct savings, but there's also a huge amount around sort of indirect and slightly intangible. And some of these things Courtney is going to talk about a little bit later when she comes on to talk about some of the, the value, benefit and savings that can be gained by your organization's use of better tech. Okay, so we've talked a bit about, about the journey, so I'm gonna sort of crack on a little bit here. We've covered off some of these things, so I'm not gonna talk through these various boxes. Let's let's get on with having a little bit of a look about what is possible, the art of the possible, what's the sort of, sort of things that you can be thinking about. So I am gonna be playing um, a couple of videos. I think I've got four very short videos. They're about three and a half minutes each. Um, and I'm just going to sort of talk through these as we go through as well. So if we just kick off it. So when you think about that initial talent attraction and retention, and this is an example of Cypher recruitment site. So whether you want to be embedding multimedia in your careers page, how do you want to be communicating to your potential hires? And these are examples of the sorts of things you can do. So again, on our own site, it's about putting out that career's information, our values, our vision, our mission. It could be benefits information. If you think about how this may work in your environment, an example here being one of our customers, Bryanston School, an independent school in Dorset, and how they present again the way that they want to attract people to their organization. So I'm sure you're all publishing your vacancies and campaigns in a variety of ways, whether that's via TES, um, whether you're linking out to job boards or agencies or publishing on your social media, but driving people to your career site. Again, so being able to create your vacancies and campaigns, pushing those out to your various sources and channels, but it's about engagement and then allowing people to go through those various processes. So whether it's about viewing job specs, advert copies, supporting documentation and the like. And as you can see here, it's about, again, representing your brand, allowing people to register for job alerts. There may not be a position available at your organization at this point in time, 
but enabling them to register with you so that when positions do become vacant, that you've already built that talent pool. You've got the ability to be communicating out to those people. And again, we're just showing you some examples here. Here's another organization, Brighton College, which gives you an indication where you might be filtering so people can be applying for different types of vacancy or campaign across different parts of the organization as well. But it's very much thinking about this as a communication tool. How do you want to be putting yourself out there? So the branding, the imagery, the information, the look and feel, as I've said, embedding multimedia, it might be a member of the teaching staff, it might be a nursery key worker talking about what it's like to work within the organization. And using technology such that um, people feel engaged with, they don't feel like just that they're a number. So allowing technology to be auto-generating communications, acknowledgements, check-ins with people over time, such that they feel again, that even if a position comes up and they're not interested in the future because they found another role, somebody else in their network may be interested that they can be pushing this through to. And then when they've gone through that recruitment journey, how do you onboard them? There might be a big time gap between offer and starting, but providing tools such that people can be accessing technology in advance of their start date so that they can be carrying out a range of tasks. But more importantly, they can be accessing content about you and your setting, your organization. So this is your chance again to underpin your brand, your culture, your identity. So your vision, your values, what do you do in the local community? But of course, it's also about administrative tasks as well. So saving time and money, whether it's around a lot, uh, checking documentation with new hires, allowing them to up upload that information, whether it's around things such as policy acceptance, whether it's staff updating their bank details in advance of their start date, their emergency content, and starting to things like compliance, safeguarding checks, automated submission to checking agencies, those sorts of things as well. So all you're really doing is you're engaging that staff member before they turn up on day one. So reduce anxiety, improve familiarization. So all we've got here is examples and it could be, this is where you're coming on day one, this is where you park. Here's some details about the school, the nursery, the college, what's gonna be happening to you on your first day, your first week, what are you gonna be issued with? and starting to think about linking out to learning management. There might be pre-joined learning that you want staff to carry out. It's just about content, and you can be deploying different streams of content to different staff members, depending on their position within the organization. If they're going into the prep school, it might be a different set of content that they're exposed to than the senior school. If they're going into one nursery location, again, it may be very different information to another nursery location. So with any onboarding facilities that you're looking at, just make sure you're considering those two streams. You're thinking about the administrative time savings that can be gained through these tools. So thinking very much around direct savings because people are capturing this data themselves, they own it, it's their responsibility, rather than filling out forms, going back and forth and having to be entered into multiple systems by your teams. It's about getting that ownership of the individual. So that sort of administrative piece, but it's also about culture, brand and identity. How do you get your culture out there? You spent time and money recruiting these people, you want to engage them in the best possible way as they onboard into your organization as well. Okay, so that's that's that first pillar, that sort of a initial initial attraction piece. So, if we now just move over to the next aspect, we're starting to think about talent. So, as you can see here, as an employee, I could be coming in and looking at a whole range of information that you you may have published out to me. Um, it may be in terms of how I want to be operating the system as well, starting to think about training and development. Okay, so the whole talent piece and well-being piece, making sure that we've got employee sentiment functionality, we've got internal NPS, so measuring the temperature of your staff, checking in with them, stopping problems before they become chronic, but then extending that out to learning, development, training. So the basics, are you capturing training history? 
completely holistically, including on the job training with managers, not just attendance on formal training courses or events? Are you tracking skills, qualifications and competencies, professional memberships, professional accreditations, but also wider competencies? Does a teacher have a certification or a license that enables them to drive the school minibus? Think about those things that are slightly out of the box, not just the academic and professional qualifications, competencies and skills. And extending that across review and assessment. So whether your operating process is around annual big bang appraisals, end of probation reviews, continuous assessment, weekly or monthly check-ins, lesson observations, enabling you to be tracking the data that you need to track and being able to effectively build your review and assessment processes yourself. So you can see some quick examples on screen here of whether it's an annual big bang performance appraisal and capturing both qualitative and quantitative data as well and you being to, able to tailor this to circumstance. So again, a continuous assessment, a weekly or monthly check-in or a lesson observation may be a couple of things that need to be recorded by a manager or the employee themselves. Whereas it's, if it's an annual big bang appraisal or review process, many more steps, okay? The sorts of things that you would expect in terms of those sort of different pages within your overall review scopes. And linking those to objective management and assessment and status. How are people performing against set objectives? Where do they sit within that process? Okay, so a range of tools to support your own operational procedures. How do you operate? And giving access to managers to see this information as well. So giving them clear visibility, ownership and authority over ensuring that they are complying with your operational standards. Whether that links through to things like performance and potential nine box grids, um, and starting even to look at things like flight risk and the impact of flight risk. Again, going back to that point of the sector around the significant challenges around retention. Obviously, the higher your turnover, the higher your employee churn, the more cost there's going to be in terms of additional recruitment and onboarding because you're having to replace these people, you're having to train them again, more learning and development. Okay. So, thinking about succession planning, who do you have in your organization that you can? develop a career path for? How can you ensure that you're communicating that to your staff members? And very much playing into that as well is thinking about how you deploy your learning. How are you deploying learning content to your employees, your staff members at the moment, such that they feel engaged, such that they feel developed and that there is an opportunity to develop? So again, you will have a range of tools I'm sure that you use to provide digital learning content to whether it's teaching staff, support staff um, via education specific tools. So teaching aids as you like, but this is about the learning content for your employees, your people. How are you delivering that? How do you build learning journeys? How do you ensure that that links to people's career path and development such that they feel valued, such as they feel that they have a long-term future with the organization. So unit, using learning management systems and platforms as well to support that piece. So again, reducing employee turnover, re reducing churn, and again, significantly saving cost and time. And start thinking about the content again, how, how you can access different types of content. At Cypher, um, we have a, a learning content division called Marshalls who specialize within the higher education space, but actually they now provide a diverse range of content applicable across the entire education space as well, with particular emphasis on um, DEI, uh, on well-being, um, and as I said, things such as neurodiversity, menopause, these are all content pieces recently released by our content division. And it's about thinking about the wider picture of how you deploy that content to your staff. Okay, so we're just going to move on to the next piece, which this is more around sort of maintenance. So this is more the sort of the detail, getting into the weeds a little bit of some of those complexities. So just starting to think around, again, 
what you want to push out there. We've got some dashboards on here for an employee that they can access. So it might be as an HR user, as a manager, I can be accessing management information and the like. But what we're going to start off looking at here is just the nuts and bolts of, of using technology to support some of those complexities within your space. So just looking at the basics of an employee record, where do I go to get my data? Where's my single source of truth? And from a pay and reward perspective, just starting to look at contractual information, looking at contractual history for employees. So drilling down and looking at things like what their terms and conditions are, their contract, uh, their job classification, their grade, their band, their spine, where they sit within the organization. Is it a temporary contract? Is it a multiple post contract? And looking at that pay information, as I've mentioned a moment ago as well. So just the maintenance of pay structures and managing your variables around allowances, payments, deductions. Again, all critical in terms of then linking into somebody's total reward. So starting to think about your remuneration aligned with your benefits and how you want to be presenting this to staff members. Think about, again, communication. There are other benefits that people enjoy outside of their salary or even allowances and one-off payments where relevant. So how do you deploy that? How do you communicate that? And the structures of your settings within HR systems, and we're starting to look really here at sort of granular nuts and bolts detail, but how do you structure your organization within technology? Does it cater for the level of complexity in terms of your, your post structures? So we're looking at a head teacher post here and looking at things like hours, occupancy. So you can be looking at under occupancy, over occupancy, what you budgeted for, linking to job descriptions, looking at pay scales, bands, ranges, all of those things as well. And also starting to think about the criteria that links to that particular post in your organization, including things like safeguarding categories and what applies to this particular role as well. So it is about how does that tech support the day-to-day -day operational standards that you need to maintain within your educational setting. And even looking a little bit behind the scenes, which is the stuff that your sort of system administrators would be operating within, within your technology, ensuring that it has the ability to, to reflect some of those complexities, whether it's around work patterns or sets of terms and conditions, term time only, those sorts of things as well. As you can see here, just where these things are structured, where they're set up, and starting to ensure that you can manage behind the scenes things such as your varying pay structures, grades, bands, and spine tables that can then be applied to the role. So as you're bringing people into the organization and they're going into a particular grade, that the systems and the tech that you're using recognize what they should be paid, what's the point that they're on. And that can be linking through on an annual basis if you're going through your annual salary uplifts and bulk uplifts of data and then the creation and generation of salary change letters that can then be made available to staff to be able to view through their own platform their self-service to be coming in and viewing uh, not just their pay slips online but be looking at their their online document filer their online online filing cabinet so that their contract change letters their salary change letters and the like as well so really just sort of showing some of those nuts and bolts that, that sit beside behind the scene there. And just lastly on this section before we move on, also starting to think about, because it is something that causes, can cause significant challenges within uh, the space and the, the sector as well, is thinking about multiple posts. Um, it's pretty prevalent within the education sector still that people may occupy more than one post, they may have multiple contracts. And how does technology support that? How does technology keep a complete historical record of every post or contract that someone has held within your organization. And I think what comes across very much is, is as I said, where as we talk to different educational settings and establishments, it's apparent that whilst there's some sharing of, of common challenges, there's always going to be different levels of complexity in terms of your contractual makeup. There's always going to be different challenges and opportunities around where you might be based geographically and the local challenges that, that you may encounter and the competition in your area for those best people as well. Okay. And, and lastly, from a sort of a quick tour perspective, just thinking about 
compliance, which is which is obviously huge in your space, absolutely critical. And there's a number of ways in which technology can support within the educational space. From a from a basic perspective, think about things like data protection, privacy. So as you as you are going out to, to find people, that initial talent attraction piece, um, enabling you to communicate, for example, your data protection and privacy statements so that when people are registering you with you, they're signing up to those, they acknowledge those. As people are onboarding with you, starting to think about policy adherence and acceptance. So the system's deploying policies and procedures out to them that they're confirming that they've read, accepted and understood. But also back to that piece around document checks, back to that piece around safeguarding, which is so critical in the education space. Ensuring that those checks are being carried out, ensuring that checks are being assigned to members of your teams appropriately and in a timely fashion to make sure that checks are carried out when they need to, but just as importantly that you can evidence that those checks have been carried out. So whether you've got an Ofsted inspection, whether it's an ISI inspection, whatever it may be, it's about ensuring that you're effectively tracking this and that you can evidence. So as you can see on here, whether it's around keeping a record of checks, being able to group those checks, and I've got an example here of a group of checks under the heading of a single central register, where I can be drilling down into individual checks. So it might be a DBS, an enhanced DBS, prohibited teachers check. So I could, could be coming in here and looking at the details behind that check. When it happened, who was responsible? It could be about uploading documentation attached to that check and even having it signed off. But other checks may require different types of data. So that flexibility to be able to track and record as little or as much as that as you need to within each of it, each individual check as well. Okay, and as you can see here, allowing you to group them. Now, safeguarding checks, though, don't just think of them about those mandatory ones as well. It's also about thinking of other checks you may want to be carrying out. There's always going to be the basic ones like reference checks, right to work checks and the like, but it's also around things like driving license checks and any other check that you might want to build into your process, your organization with automated email triggers, alerts, reminders, flags, and the ability, as you can see on here, with a, a little bit of a sort of traffic-like system that I've got the ability to be coming in here and looking at the status of my safeguarding activity. Also in respect of compliance, look everything around sort of case management, people inquiries and cases, employee relations. So being able to manage your grievance, your disciplinary, but also on a more positive front, being able to manage things with more of a positive connotation, could be flexible working requests by staff members that are flagged through here and could be underpinned by workflow. But in the example we're looking at here, being able to track a case, keep that complete history, involve participants, track outcomes, resolutions, and hopefully wouldn't be happening, um, but things such as tribunal information as well. Okay, so that whole case management piece also playing in that space of compliance. And lastly, thinking again, a little bit back to that data protection piece, any piece of HR system, anything that you're holding personally identifiable data in relation to your staff, as you're all aware, it's also about ensuring that you're meeting your obligations around data protection. So whether it's allowing employees to submit subject access requests through technology, or whether, as we're looking at briefly here, you have that ability when staff are leaving you to archive, to anonymize data, and get support from the technology to support you, uh, in terms of flags, triggers, alerts, and even supporting offboarding processes as well. So potentially allowing staff to continue to access their online payslips, perhaps for three months after their leaving date, so that they can draw down those documents without being able to access or see or do anything else. Lastly, before, before we move over to talking about sort of values and benefits that are gained, is on that compliance piece also just very much to highlight around talking to about to your technology providers around how they can assist around those statutory returns. So whether you are having to do FE data collections, whether you're doing school census returns, workforce census returns, single central registers or other tools, if you're holding this data within technology, it is about how you can get that information out, not just to support your operational day-to-day -day reporting, to support the business and inform your organizational strategy, but it's also then about 
how it can support you in terms of those statutory and mandatory returns as well. Okay, so I am just going to move on and I'm going to hand over to, to Courtney. I'll still drive the deck, but just hand over to, to Courtney to talk a little bit around um, really the sort of value and benefits that can be gained from technology. So Courtney. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Um, Um, so yeah, so earlier in the session, Phil would have touched on some sector specific challenges, but to sum up some key points, why the ed education sector needs HR software, essentially the case. So it supports the management of the full end to end life cycle of employees from attraction, recruitment, onboarding, development, retention, compliance and offboarding. It streamlines processes, processes across a diverse employee base. In particular, in the education sector, we come across multiple contract types, full-time, part-time, term-time only, zero-hour contracts. The employee base can also have varying work patterns from standard Monday to Friday to shift patterns, whether it be three days a week um, at five hours per day or five days a week over a two-week rotating period. We also have differing job classifications, whether it be support staff, teaching staff, volunteers, bank staff, casual staff, uh, the list can continue. And pay structure, something that Phil touched quite a lot on, is that itself brings complexities, grades, spines, rates, bands, spot salaries, um, pay reviews, spinal increments, um, it all just seems to all happen all at once. It also supports a flexible mobile workforce, so generally, again, in the education sector, employees are not sat in front of a computer from nine to five, and in some cases may not even have access to a computer. So HR software can be accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, across multiple devices by users. It supports the policy framework and helps to empower staff and improve communication through ease of access to policies that may or may not require approval company relevant documents, handbooks, company-wide communications, whether it be via newsletter or on a landing page, which again, you saw that in some of the demonstrations done by Phil. You may even decide to include the requirements of the policy lifecycle in your onboarding process, ensuring that new recruits are gaining access to important documentation from the moment they start your onboarding process, which essentially could be nine months before they actually start with you. It reduces administration and risk within the HR team as it eliminates paper-based processes and instead supports a single point of entry, therefore creating a single source of truth. Additionally, integrations can support the movement of data across systems, allowing the same data to be transferred between systems, increasing data integrity and reducing risk. An example being when a new starter joins the organization, you may want an auto activation to potential benefit platforms or when leavers leave and you need them to be removed from IT systems. Integrations can be key. It assists with compliance, safeguarding and audit responsibilities, facilitating the recording of DBS, right to work, CPD, training, job and pay related information, including change reasons. An audit log within the system can support the reporting of data changes, when and who access the system, and very importantly, provides a safe and secure environment of people data aligned to GDPR. It delivers effective, intuitive management information, whether it be mandatory reports such as schools workforce census, FE workforce return, or the single central register as well as any additional reporting requirements that the management team may require on an ad hoc or scheduled basis. By enabling a single point of entry, data entry, data can be easily accessible as and when required, which will help the organization make informed decisions, saving time and money. It helps the HR team add value to the wider organization through the reduction of administrative tasks resulting in more time being made available to support on strategic application. Changing the HR role from what it was a few years ago, being very much a processing based role to a role which can now place more emphasis on creating and maintaining a positive organizational culture, whilst ensuring employees feel valued and supported 
and contributing to higher levels of productivity and organizational success. And it delivers return of investment gained via direct cost savings, example being reduction in admin or processing time and resources, using management information to inform strategic decisions and employees and employee intervention, as well as improved tracking and management of performance management, development, succession planning, and supporting lower turnover, less recruitment and replacement costs. Whilst indirect savings also, also can be improved communication, collaboration, engagement and underpinning of organisational brand and culture, supporting again by the retention of the best talent. So what are the benefits to our customers? What is the value that Cypher is delivering to our customers? So we do listen to our customers and our customers are definitely sharing some good insight. Improved attraction and retention of staff by improving employees' experiences from hire to retire. By implementing Cypher I Recruit, it is alleviating pressures on HR teams by digitizing and automating time-consuming recruitment processes. By using the Candidate Importer tool, it is streamlining the flow of, flow of new recruits from Cypher I Recruit into Cypher HR, where customers are then su supported by Cypher onboarding to onboard the employees. When, with employees being able to self-serve, customers are finding value in that employees can self-serve throughout their employee life cycle, from requesting holiday, managing absences, updating their employee personal record, logging and managing expenses, reviewing com company policies, and identifying training development needs. Again, the list goes on and on. It also reduces time and resources to requ required to deliver outputs, with HR teams allowing focuses to shift from paper to strategic. Examples include, what was the distribution of management reports which took days to create, manipulate and send out, can now be auto-generated or accessible direct from managers within the system. Reducing time spent on generating and distributing salary change letters across the workforce can now be sent out in bulk through the system. Reduces administrative in administrative tasks and places responsibility on the employee to own their data. A applying pay reviews, incremental changes across large groups of employees can now be done in a matter of a couple of clicks. And communicating information can be made accessible on landing pages, reducing the risk of employees not being made aware or missing out on key, key information. Another benefit is that customers are benefiting from better data reliability and validity as having a single point of data entry which is accessible to employees, managers and HR users allows these users to actively update and engage with the data held within the system and where applicable verified by designated approval workflows which is then reportable and supports organisational decisions. Improving maintenance and operational costs through recording employee performance, conducting classroom observations, broadening access to training and development, absence management, easing the administrative burden on HR teams, enabling manager accountability and ownership, resulting in operational efficiency and long-term trend analysis. Indirect cost saving by avoiding unnecessary costs made by indirect decisions, incorrect decisions, with HR teams, managers and key decision makers having ease of access to data, including establishment reports, absence reports, turnover reports, to name only a few of the current 165 plus reports accessible from the start of implementation. Increased employee satisfaction as employees now feel empowered to own their data and their careers, enabling them to identify their skills and potential training and development needs, while also having ease of access to key communication, reviewing policies and access to company-wide documentation. It boosts individual and team performance by having visibility of organisational company goals and being able to work together to achieve these, while also having the ability to identify their own objectives, which can be personal, or company-wide and contributes to strategic organize, organizational objectives. This finally empowers employees to take ownership of their career, which boosts individual morale, which positively impacts the wider team and the organization. 
Thank you. Handing back to Phil. Thank you, Catherine. So just in terms of a, a recap there, bear with me a moment. Um, just in terms of recap, look, hopefully we've given you a bit of a feel for some of the challenges, which I'm sure you'll be acutely aware of within your own organizations, but across that education space. And, and again, we've highlighted some of those things that will be very common and very typical across various education settings. Um, but I think also thinking about what technology you have in place to support that attraction that development and that retention of the best talent in your space. Um, how does that technology interact? How does it link together? Does it link with your school management systems, with your finance systems? As Courtney mentioned, does it streamline the way that technical accounts are created, are disabled? And are you achieving that value for money and a return on your investment? So thinking about not just the direct savings that you may gain, again, many of which were highlighted by Courtney, but also thinking about those, those indirect savings as well, those slight intangibles can be difficult to measure, um, but around employee satisfaction, around morale. So how does access to learning content, how does development, how does career planning assist in the way that you retain those best staff? And again, significantly then impacting on your ongoing turnover, re-recruitment, retraining. And it is about that, that wider positive impact and, and taking these tools away from the traditional reactive administrative tools that they were used many, many years ago to, to be far more of a strategic business tool. Um, at the end of the day, you are generally looking after the most expensive assets within your organization base, okay, the people. Um, and ultimately, you're typically the first touch point for people coming into the organization and the last touch point before they go. So it's very much about making sure that your, your HR software, your people management solutions are that central source of truth in terms of people data, people management. So enabling you to manage those processes as effectively as possible, reduce your administration, integrate with other systems and services across your organization, and, and ultimately strategically inform the organization direction as well. Um, and again, all of this needs to be considered in relation to what you've currently got, and as part of any future selection process that you may go through. And, and I would just finish with saying, as I mentioned earlier, none of the tech or the tools out there are a magic bullet. This is as much around your, your processes, your culture, your brand, your identity, your board, your governors, your trustees. How do they see the management of people? How do they see the culture, the brand, the identity? Technology can assist, it can support, it can underpin, it can't do everything but it can play a significant part in driving that culture in terms of driving down, um, driving up rather cost savings and return on investment as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Courtney. Loads of food for thought today um, and really in-depth look at all the different areas of our products, which hopefully you found really useful. Um, we are coming up to our closing time, but we do have a little bit of time for any questions. So if you have those um, for Phil or Courtney, please send them in using the question box on your screen now. We've only got a couple of minutes, so get typing. Um, and in the meantime, um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. And um, first that came to mind was, what kind of reassurance or advice would you give for education institutions who might be thinking about switching HR software providers and haven't been through that process of changing from one vendor to another and that can seem quite daunting yeah I, I think and again Courtney can can come in in a moment as well I think in in terms of that change process it, it is about it's about being very diligent uh, ultimately the responsibility is on you uh, as the customer to ensure that you've, you've carried out appropriate selection processes that you have ensured that you've asked the right questions that you've gathered the um, the opinions, the inputs of the various stakeholders within your own organization to, to ensure that you are really making sure that there's an alignment of expectation between what you are expecting and what you want that partner organization, the organization that ultimately you select to work with. That there's complete alignment on what you're expecting, what they're expecting to deliver. And I, and I think that it depends very much on the maturity of the individual customer, whether they've used systems previously or whether they're coming from more sort of spreadsheet-based um, activities into a specialist HR system or HR platform for the first time. 
Um, it's very much about ensuring that alignment of expectations is critical, but it's also about being realistic. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, these tools don't do everything, uh, and different platforms that you look at will have different strengths and different weaknesses in comparison to each other. But it's about making sure that you gain as much value as you possibly can and prioritize those components that are most important to you. Anything on that one? Yeah, just from an implementation perspective, I think um, you know we get a good we get a good mix. Some some do have current platforms that they're moving across, and some some don't. And I think we have a good team um, on our side in terms of project managers, implementation consultants, um, as as well as um, various other teams. But when we do implement with customers that have got current platforms, is we help facilitate that. So. One of our biggest emphasis, what we emphasize a lot of our, um, what we place a lot of emphasis on is actually around that data cleansing exercise. So often when customers are bringing data across from a previous system is the data is not ideal or they've got many um, work patterns or they may have multiple grades and spines that are actually no longer applicable. So, you know, we have the tools, we have the processes and we do support our customers in the implementation. And also a lot of our implementation consultants are actually um, HR professionals in terms of qualification. So they understand um, the customers that we're talking to um, and the other pressures they have around them, not only from implementing a, a system, but more so the day-to-day -day jobs that they've got, people management. So um, it's just about kind of that communication piece and making sure that we work with the customer um, as well as the customer working with us to, to meet, meet those key objectives and, and tasks and action and what they need to, to action at, at appropriate points. Great. And then there would be ongoing support post go live as well. Yeah. So again, yeah. um, throughout your implementation, you, you've got an, an implementation consultant, um, you've then got a project manager, um, we've also got access to our academy. So Cypher Academy is a key area of, of guidance, support, being webinars, e-learning, guides, uh, training. Um, and then once your implementation is over, you then move into sort of BAU, where you then hand it over to a, su a customer success manager. Um, but again, we don't all fall away. Um, we've also got our customer care team. So yes, definitely um, throughout your journey with us as a customer, you, there's always someone to talk to or someone to rely on. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of uh, functionality specific questions, which I hope you can answer. Um, how easy is it to provide view only or restricted access by department? So, for example, the estates department being able to view driving licenses or IT being able to review um, identity documents? Yeah, so we've got quite a um a good security model within Cypher HR um, or for, within Cypher and it's all user role based so we can have as many different user role accesses as you want and it could be down to field it could be down to task so as you saw in Phil's demonstration when he was looking at personal details there were things there like NI number where maybe you want the employee to see that but you don't want the manager to see it so in your example of the estate that's something that a lot of our customers do do where they've maybe got a finance user an operational user a facilities user and you want them to be able to see asset registers or property um, or even car parking so a lot of our customers have got par parking permits but you only want certain individuals to be able to see that um, or you only want employees to be able to make certain changes. So we can really be quite far out with our security. Fantastic. Um, and the last question before we close, um, how does Cyber produce the school's SDR for inspection? Yes, yeah, so when, um, hopefully I can get this right, um, Phil, please feel free to jump in, sure. but referring to the single central register, um, it will be down to you through consultancy. So when we build your safe safeguarding area or employee checks area, we'll be asking you what is important um, to you in terms of that SCR. So if you want to be reporting on right to work, DBS, um, your, your teaching certifications, we then will link that specific check um, to the actual um, to the actual SCR. So when it comes to actually pulling down that SCR, those checks are linked. So not every single um, safeguarding category needs to be linked to SCR, only the ones that you feel is appropriate and applicable for your reporting requirements. 
And, in ter and just to add to that, in terms of sort of that evidentiary side, obviously, if you've got an Ofsted or an ISI inspection, then yes, you could be letting them look at the system, but you've also got the ability to output that data. So you can be pushing that data out into Excel, for example, into reporting formats that can then be shown, printed out, presented um, as part of that inspectors as well. So you've got the evidentiary side within the system itself, but there's, a, there's several means of also exporting that and reporting on that data to be able to provide that documentary evidence. Okay, fantastic. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, we've just run out of time here for any further questions, but I appreciate you answering the ones that we had come in. And um, Phil, if you wouldn't mind just flipping onto the next slide, that'd be brilliant. Um, as a reminder, this webinar has all been recorded and uh, this recording will be sent to you later today. There's no action you need to take on that front. Um, you can share that with a colleague or review any of the content again. If you'd like to learn more about our solutions, you can opt in using the exit form on your screen after the broadcast or you can email our team at info at .com. Uh, Thanks, Will and Courtney, for sharing all your expertise today. It's been great to work with you on this one. Thanks, everyone, for attending and, and being so engaged. We appreciate it. We hope you found it useful. Um, and that we hope to see you again at another cycle webinar soon. Take care. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.